everyone's 2021 has been well. Uh, let's see. And let's share. Um, one of the things that I do want to say to those who are watching and listening um, is because God has revealed his truth to us. I don't want those of us to think or feel that that's a reason to use what the Lord has blessed us with, this knowledge of his truth, to bash other people who don't know the truth or, or who don't have the truth or who think they have the truth but don't. Because again, we were once in that situation before. And so we don't want to pump ourselves up and puff ourselves up and begin to criticize and begin to um, downgrade um, someone else because they're not exposed to this knowledge yet. We want to love them in peace. We want to show them things that maybe they are not fully aware of. You are joining and you ask the Lord video. to bless them to you increase their knowledge. And can speak with the host. All right. So let's get this recording started. And we're going to get ready for our YouTube to begin to start in 10 seconds. All right, five seconds. You are joining the online studio. Your line is muted. Only the host can unmute your line. Raise your hand using star two so the host knows when you are speaking. Recording started. Okay, we thank you, brothers and sisters, again, for those who are tuning in via Poet Radio. And also, we thank those who are watching via YouTube. Again, YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. We thank you. We thank you for subscribing. We thank you for sharing. We thank you for your comments that you make. And if you're watching on YouTube, please leave a comment so that we will know um, that you've been blessed. If you've been blessed with any of the lessons that we do, please leave a comment, um, YouTube. All right. And so we want to get into today's lesson. The day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. OK, today is March the. I'm sorry, not March. Today is May 18th, 2021, and this, this is Tuesday, and this Sunday or Saturday at sundown would begin the Lord's Day of Pentecost. Again, it would begin the Lord's Day of Pentecost, and so we wanted to come before you this evening to share with you, brothers and sisters, what thus saith the Lord and how this is a day that he commands us to keep. And what it means and what we should be doing. Okay, all those things. And you get it right here on this program today. Again, you get it right here on this program today. And so, yeah, I see a lot of people who are interested in shirts. We definitely appreciate that. We'll get into that at the end of the show. Sister Key Israel and I will put my number up. And so we'll respond to your messages at the end of the show. But let's go ahead and get into the Lord's business right now. We're going to start with the what we believe. And so people have no doubt what we stand for as a Bible class on, on, on the Truth Hour Ministries. All right. The Truth Hour um, Bible class is a Bible based ministry, a social media online Bible-based ministry. We teach the uncut word of God as it, as, it, as it is written in the Bible, line upon line, precept upon precept, Isaiah 28 and 10. Our mission is to lead as many souls to Jesus, the Christ, so that through the word of God and the keeping of the commandments, they may receive salvation. Our motto is, if you cannot read it, then do not believe it. What do we believe? Number one. We believe in the name of Jesus. We have no dispute with the use of other names, but we prefer to use the English name Jesus because our listeners speak English and understand English. All right. Number two, we, we believe that Jesus alone is our Lord and Savior. Number three, we believe in the Sabbath day, which is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. 
All right. Number four, we believe in the seven feast days of the Lord as listed in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Number five, we believe that we, the so-called African-American and those who were spread throughout the world through the transatlantic slave trade are indeed Israelites and all the Lord's statutes, laws and commandments apply to us. Number six, we believe that we must still keep the law to the best of our knowledge and ability. Number seven, we believe that we must keep the Lord's dietary law according to Leviticus the 11th chapter. No pork, no shrimp, no catfish, no lobster, or anything that's deemed unpermissible in the book of Leviticus the 11th chapter. All right. Number eight, we believe that both the scriptures or Old Testament and the testimony New Testament must be used when teaching the word of God. You can't be a New Testament Christian or an Old Testament scholar. You must be both. Isaiah 8 and 20. We don't believe in Sunday Sabbath service. We don't believe in the Trinity doctrine. Well, you say, well, black guys, why don't you even believe in Sunday Sabbath service? Because the Lord said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The Sabbath day is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. It is the seventh day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. So the Romans changed the Lord's day from the Sabbath day, which is on Saturday to the first day of the week, Sunday. So we don't believe in Sunday Sabbath service. We don't believe in the Trinity doctrine. We don't believe in the cross or images or holidays that originated in the worship of other gods, such as Easter or Christmas. They are not biblical in nature. These are um, holidays that man created which was to worship the gods of that particular time in which they created those particular days. All these are anti-Christ or against God, according to the Bible. Number 10, we believe that salvation through Jesus is for all people, no matter what race, color, or nationality, Revelation 7 and 9. Brothers, at this time, we ask that if you have a hat on, that you remove your hats, and sisters, at this time, we ask that you, if you don't have a head covering on, that you place a head covering over your head so that you can be in compliances, in compliance with the ordinances of God listed in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 3 through 6. Now, let's get into today's word, the Pentecost. When we look at the, 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 the Lord's feast days, we see a very prophetic event which represents events to come. In other words, each feast day represents an actual event. Remember the Passover, the event that happened or took place during that time was the blood covering the side post and the post over the door, which Save the lives of not only the Israelites, but the Egyptians that complied with the order of Moses that was given to him by God to stay under the blood, right? And so that was an actual event. And today we are covered by the blood of Jesus, which helps us to gain everlasting life. So that's your Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, another feast, which Began as an actual event. Once the firstborn in Egypt was killed, with the exception of those who were under the blood, right? Stayed in the house. Then after that was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which means that leavening represented sin. And so it, it, it represented removing sin. Okay? And so they didn't have time to bake their bread. They left Egypt. OK, and so that leavening represented sin. So when we come under the blood of Jesus, that's when we begin the process of living a different life and remove the sin from our life. So now we're at the day of Pentecost. And so we're going to explain to you tonight the meaning of this particular holy day or feast day. In this lesson, we're going to look at the Lord's day of Pentecost, its meaning, its importance and the the commandment of the Lord to keep it. So let's start off with the name itself first. What is the meaning 
of the word Pentecost. The word Penta comes from the Greek root, which means five. The word Penta comes from the Greek root, which means five. Like pentagram is a five-pointed star. Pentagon is a building in Washington that's made with five different points. And so please begin to learn the root of these words so that you can understand what these words mean. We talked about that in the months of the year. October, any word that begins with oct, O-C-T, means eight. Although man changed the month from the eighth month of the year to the tenth month of the year. But D-E-C, any word that begins with it, means ten. Like decade, ten years, decimal point, rounding to the nearest tenth. But man took December, which was the tenth month of the year, and moved it and made it the twelfth month of the year. But we know that it was the tenth month because the root of the word December, D-E-C, means ten. The root of the word November, nov, means nine. The root of the word oct, any word begins with that, means eight. Octopus, eight tentacles. Octagon, eight sides. October, eight months. So the word penta means five. The word Pentecost derives from the root penta, um, again, which is five, but Pentecost comes from the Greek word meaning 50th. Okay, Pentecost comes from the Greek word meaning 50th. So there is no special significance of the word Pentecost. I know we have a religion today called Pentecostal religion. You say, I, I, I'm, I'm Pentecostal. There's no special significance, brothers and sisters, of the word itself. It just means 50th. That's it. So we want to make you understand in the beginning and lay a foundation that it's not the word, brothers and sisters, itself. It is the day, the feast day that the Lord gave us, right? Now, let's look at the popular Christianity unbiblical definition. That's why this shirt is here. Biblical Christianity is unpopular. Popular Christianity is unbiblical. So we're going to look at the popular Christianity unbiblical definition, and then we're going to look at the unpopular Christianity biblical definition. Let's go to Wikipedia first. Check out what Wikipedia does, right? We already know that Easter is anti-Christ and that it has nothing to do with Jesus or the Bible, that it originated in, in the worship of the goddess of fertility, Esther, the fertility god, which was celebrated in spring. We know that. But look at the way that they crept Easter into the definition of Pentecost. Wikipedia gives a distorted view and definition. The Christian holiday of Pentecost is a movable feast, which is celebrated on the 50th day, the seventh Sunday from Easter Sunday. It commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and other followers of Jesus Christ while they were in Jerusalem celebrating the feast, the feast of weeks. So now, that is the Wikipedia definition, right? It's all about the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles. It has a connection to Easter in it. But <clears throat> we're going to look at something. In here, we're going to look at something. So the first place we're going to go is Esther. The book of Esther, the eighth chapter, verse nine. The book of Esther, the eighth chapter, verse nine. Now, we want you to follow your Bible with us, brothers and sisters, because this is a Bible-based ministry. And we do nothing on this show outside of reading the word of God. We don't come with our own personal opinions. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you and I have been told or been taught. It doesn't matter what we think, how we feel. Only thing that matters is what we can read out of this book. So this is why we say if you can't read it, do not believe it. <clears throat> Pentecost. Esther 8 and 9. Esther 8 and 9. It says, there were the, then were the kings and scribes called at the time... In the third month, let's stop right there. What month are we talking about? 
<coughs> the third month. Now, we're not talking about the month of March because the month of March is not the third month of the year. We're going to explain that to you also. It says, then were the king's scribes called at the time in the third month, that is the month of Saban. So the third month is called Saban. That's the biblical. So now we, now we know that. Something that we may not have known before. On the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that M Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies and the rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, and 127 provinces unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. So <clears throat> right now we are the third month of the year. According to this, we are in the month of Savan. Okay. And so we want to continue with this because we want to show you what falls in the third month of the year, which is called Savan. So we're going to go ahead <clears throat> and go to another, I want to make sure that we got all that we got from here. I want to make sure that we got all that we got from here. All right. Great. So let's now go to the book of the book of Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter, the book of Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter. So in this third month, which is the day of Pentecost. Remember, it is 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay? 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But you can't just can't start the day after the Feast of Unleavened Bread because if the Feast of Unleavened Bread does not end on a Saturday or before the Sabbath day, you got to count the next Sabbath day. We will add all those things up for you. I know right now it might be a little bit of difficult sounding, but hang in there and we'll show you. And this is why we tell you that it's the third month, because the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is in the first month. The 14th day of the first month, Passover. The 15th day of the first month, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a seven day feast. And then when you start at the Sabbath, the next Sabbath that's after the Feast of Unleavened Bread and you count 50 days, now you're falling in the third month of the year, which is called Saban in the Bible. But let's go to Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter. Passover, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Pentecost will always fall on a Sunday or Saturday at sundown. Again, Pentecost will always um, start on a Sunday or Saturday at sundown. Right. Pentecost is all about offerings, your first fruits and your best. Deuteronomy 16, chapter. Verses nine through 11. Deuteronomy 16. Verses nine. Through 11. And it reads. Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. Now, Abib, which is the first month, in the name Abib is, is give roots from the term ear of corn. Okay? So these feasts are associated with harvest and, 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 and reaping the harvest that you have sown. We'll get into that a little bit further. Verse 10, it says, thou shalt keep the feast of weeks. That's one of the names of Pentecost. So we have Pentecost and we have feast of weeks. Same thing. Thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with the tribute of a free will offering of thine hand. So there has to be an offering associated with this feast day which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according to the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. So the more the Lord has blessed you, the more you are supposed to offer. Again, the more the Lord has blessed you, the more you're supposed to offer. So if you haven't given anything, 
this is the day you got to give, brothers and sisters. All right? Verse 11. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God. You and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite that is within thy gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you in the place which the Lord God has chosen to place his name. So now we got an understanding that this is a free will offering. It is the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, same exact thing. And it said seven weeks. This is how you determine it and this is how you get to it. There has to be seven weeks, okay, or seven Sabbaths. And we're going to get into that a little bit in our lesson. So let's go to the next uh, scripture, Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Now we're getting right into it, brothers and sisters. As Christians or as followers of Jesus, we are commanded to keep the Lord's day of Pentecost. All right. We are commanded to keep the Lord's day of Pentecost. So let's go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And I want to start a little bit above to show you how this thing falls and that this is the Lord's feast and not man's feast and not Moses' feast and not the Jews' feast because you're here that hear that. Oh, we ain't got to do that no more. That was the Jews' feast. And you will hear so-called African-Americans saying that as if they are not Israelites. But again, we don't even know who we are anymore. So it directly pertains to us, sons and daughters of the transatlantic slave trade. Verse 1, and the Lord spake unto Moses, this is Leviticus 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, and these are my feasts. So, Sister Key, put up Leviticus 23, and we'll do 1 through 5. Leviticus 23, 1 through 5. Verse 3, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest. So there can't be two Sabbath days. So it's either Saturday or Sunday. It's either Saturday or Sunday. Now, what day of the week do they call the hump day? They call the hump day what? Wednesday. So if Wednesday is the hump, which is the middle, there has to be an equal amount of days before the hump and an equal amount of days after the hump. So what three days are before Wednesday? You got Sunday, one, Monday, two. I'm sorry. You have um, Sunday, yeah, you got Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So Sunday is the first day of the week. Monday is the second day of the week. Tuesday is the third day of the week. Then you got hump day in the middle. And you got to have an equal number of days after the hump. So three days that are after Wednesday is Thursday, Friday, the fifth day of the week, the sixth day of the week, Thursday, Friday, and then the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday. So you can't have two Sabbaths. It's either Saturday or it's Sunday. And we just showed you that Sunday is not the Sabbath day. And this is why we don't support it or believe in it. So it says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So you can't use the excuse, well, we're not in our land anymore. So we don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. And then it jumps down at verse three. It says, it is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings and all of your dwellings. So it don't matter where we live. If you can get that day off work, brothers and sisters, take the day off work. And if they offer you overtime that day, refuse the overtime that day because then the choice is yours. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's in the Ten Commandments, Exodus, the 20th chapter. Verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, not of Moses, not of the Jews. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which means gatherings. On these feast days, you got to have gatherings. 
which you shall proclaim in their seasons. So each feast day got a season attached to it. Right? So now, we talked about the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread being in the first month of the year. But again, remember, the Lord's time is different from man's time. So it says, in the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. When was the Lord's Passover this year? The Lord's Passover, it said it was in the first month here in the Bible, right? But we know that the first month of the year this year was in the month of March. How do we know that? Because we know what day Passover fell on, right? So this year, Passover fell on, and I know you're looking at it backwards. This year, Passover fell on March 27th, okay? March 27th. So it says on the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. So if the Passover was on March 27th, that means that the first day of God's new year this year, Started on March 13th. Because 13 plus 14 is 27. So God's new year this year started on March 13th. 14 days after that, which was March 27th, was the Lord's Passover. But what happened the next day after the Lord's Passover? Verse 6. It says on the 15th day of the same month, we're still in the first month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and unto the Lord seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Another lesson for another time, but we just wanted to show you that. Now, let's go down to the Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks. We got two names for it, describing it already. Verse 9. Leviticus 23 and 9, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I will give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, it's seasonal, it's a harvest feast, brothers and sisters, then you shall bring a sheaf, then you shall bring a sheaf. So I know, brothers and sisters, that we don't know a lot of these terms because we don't live in a country anymore. We don't live down south anymore. We're not agricultural anymore. We're not picking cotton anymore. So you say, what the hell is a sheaf? This is a sheaf, brothers and sisters. This is a sheaf where you pick the grain, right? And you sift the grain, and you put the grain together and you tie around the grain and it becomes a sheaf. It says, and you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf. Well, let me back up a little bit to verse 10. It says, then shall you bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So when you go start um, sifting the, 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 um, the grain and you get that sheaf together. You offer that first one to the Lord, your first fruits unto the Lord. What do you do with the sheaf? And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the next day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and he, a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Do you see where they're going? First fruits, a lamb without blemish. You see where they're going with this, how Pentecost is directly connected to Jesus, who is the lamb without blemish and who is the first fruit of them that slept. So I want you to begin to see the connection that's going on here, brothers and sisters. Let's keep on reading down to verse 16. And it reads, And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour minched with oil. This is verse 13. It says, 
an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine. Okay? And the fourth part of a hen. So you say, well, wait a minute. What is a hen? What is the fourth part of a hen? So when you um, look at this thing, brothers and sisters, and you see these words, you don't understand it because, again, we're not working in the fields anymore like we used to work in the fields. But we got this thing for you today. And we wanted to show you this thing so that you would be aware and know what some of these things are. So let me show you what a hen is. This is the device that we use, brothers and sisters, to um, measure our wheat. So this is a hen right here. All right. They will put it right here and I'll read it again. It says at verse um, 14, and you shall, well, wait, I'm sorry, not verse 14, verse 13. It says, and the drink offering there shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. So you see right here, and you're going up, you're going up, you're going up, you're going up. This is how they divided what a fourth was, what a half was, what a three-fourths was, what a full um, what a fool was because they had a hen, brothers and sisters. Verse 14, and you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor eat green ears until the selfsame day that you have brought an offering <clears throat> unto your God. It shall be a statue forever. So when were we supposed to stop doing this? Because some people say, well, we ain't in the Old Testament no more. We ain't got to do the day of Pentecost anymore because we ain't in the Old Testament anymore. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations as long as you're having children. In all of your dwellings, no matter whether you are in the land or you went to America as slaves or any of the islands as slaves, it shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And you shall count unto you from the next day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the next day after the seventh Sabbath, because seven times seven is seven days in a week. So seven Sabbaths, seven weeks, seven times seven is 49. But you got one more day. Even until the next day after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number 50 days. So this is how you get to 50 days. And you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So brothers and sisters, a lot of people couldn't really count to see how we got to this Sunday coming up. As... Um, the 50th day, you know, adding and counting and adding and counting. So I just want to show you this, if I can get it together. Uh, let's see if I can get this calendar together to kind of show you. Mm, okay, cool. I think I could do it. I think I could do it. I'll take it. And uh, let's see. So I'll take it and I'll reverse it so that it could show right to you. So this is how we get seven Sabbaths, right? So remember, the Passover was on the 27th of March, right? Which led after that straight into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread ended. Okay, let me save this. The Feast of Unleavened Bread ended on... April the 4th, right? So, we can't count. Let me see if I can do this for you. It's hard looking at this thing backwards. Let me see if I can get a pen. There you go. So, there's your April the 4th. We're not counting that. We got to count the Sabbath after that. So, you got 11th. That's 1, 2, three, right? Oh, I'm sorry. This is July. 
I'm sorry. Uh, okay, there's the fourth right there. So they both had fours in them. All right. So there's your April the fourth. We can't count the fourth. So we got to count the next Sabbath starting with that. So there's the eleventh. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then you fall here with seven, which will be the twenty-third. Remember, it's seven Sabbaths plus that one day after. The Sabbath, okay? Seven Sabbaths plus that one day after the Sabbath. So I was counting the Sundays, but you really want to count the Saturdays, okay? You really want to count the, the Sabbath days, but it was kind of cut off on this, um, on this calendar. So if you count the Sabbaths, you got the third, the tenth, the seventeenth. Well, I can show you right here. I, I, I guess I could show you right here. See, y'all let me know if it's clear. All right. So, and it's just so hard, man, looking at this thing backwards. Where are we at? April. So there's your Saturday, right? So you got, there's your Sabbath day. So you got Tiff. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then it says, even the next day after the Sabbath, because that's 49 days. The next day after is the 23rd. So you see where that falls on the 23rd. And this was really not a good calendar to use because I see the way they switched up to try to make Sunday the last day on the calendar. But that's neither here nor there. The Bible knows what it is. It told us what it is. And we got it right. So let me know if y'all understood the graphic that I just gave you guys. Again. You have to count the Sabbath after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So on this case, the Sabbath, um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread ended on April the 4th. So we had to start counting the next Sabbath. All right. So you can count that on your own and um, start with the 10th. And then you go seven Sabbaths from there, from the 10th, April 10th. And then when you fall down, you fall on the 22nd of May which is your seventh Sabbath, and then it says the day after. So I'm going to read that again. Verses 15 and 16 of Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the day after the seventh um, Sabbath shall you number 50 days and you shall have a wave offering. This is how we got to this Sunday coming up or actually it starts Saturday at sundown because you know a new day starts at sundown. Woo, if I felt like I spent a lot of time on that. All right, let's go to the next thing. The next thing is the Cain spirit. Okay? The Cain spirit. We don't want the Cain spirit and let's tell you what the Cain spirit is. Because again, on the day of Pentecost, you got to offer your first and your best. Again, you have to offer your first and your best. So why is it important to the Lord that you bring your best? It is important to show respect and appreciation to the Lord in order for you to be accepted. Let's go to Leviticus 22. Leviticus 22, and we're going to read 22 through 24. Leviticus 22, and then we're going to read 22 through 24. And it reads, it says, blind or broken or maimed or having a wing or scurvy or scabbed, you shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. So see, a lot of times us Israelites, we didn't want to give our best. We figured like, hey, if this is going to be an offering and if this was going to be burnt, then I might as well do that with the defective ones that I have. Okay, I might as well do that with the defective ones that I have. So they didn't want to do that with the defective ones, brothers and sisters. They didn't want to do that with the defective ones. So um, the Lord said, no, bring me your best. 
I want your best. I want your first and I want your best. So this says blind or broken or maimed or having a wing or scurvy or scab. You shall not offer these things unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. Either a bullock or a lamb that have anything superfluous or lacking in his parts that mayest thou offer for a free will offering, but for a vow, it shall not be accepted. You shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised or crushed <clears throat> or broken or cut. Neither shall you make any offering thereof in your land. So those who do the opposite of what the Lord commands them to do falls under what we consider the Cain spirit. Now, let's go to Genesis, the fourth chapter. Let's deal with this Cain spirit. Genesis, the fourth chapter. And we're going to read verses one through four. Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses one through four. It says, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, which only means that he had sex with her. That's what the word knew mean, meant, meant in the um in the scripture, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. So he had sex with her, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass, so we don't know how long it had been, right? We know that Adam and Eve had more children outside of Cain and Abel. So when this says, and in process of time, we don't know how much time had passed. It doesn't say. It just says, and in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his fruit. Well, wait a minute. It just said that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offering. But when it got to Abel, it says, he brought of the firstlings of his flock. Remember, it got to be your first and it got to be your best. He also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain, at verse five, but unto Cain, and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very angry. And he started frowning in his face. His countenance fell. Why didn't he have respect to Cain? Because the Cain spirit said that I ain't bringing you my best. I ain't bringing you my first. I'm looking out for me first. And what I want and what I like. And then I'm giving you what's left over. The Lord said, uh-uh. I ain't having it. I blessed you with it. And in return, you're going to give me your first. And you're going to give me your best. So the day of Pentecost is about your first. And it's about your best. It is a time for you to make an offering unto the Lord. So if you never gave an offering to your church or to your houses of worship. This is the day to do it, brothers and sisters. And if you're going to have a feast, or if you're going to have a festival, you don't come empty-handed. You come bringing something, brothers and sisters. All right? So, get in that kitchen. Start cooking up whatever you're going to bring to the feast brothers and sisters, because this is a feast. A dinner or a feast is required. It's a requirement of this particular day. So some people say, well, I could just go to, you know, I could just go to church or I could just go to Bible class or I could just watch it. And I've done my time. I've, I've served my duty for that particular day. A dinner is required, brothers and sisters. A feast is required. Now, when you have no respect for the Lord, he will have no respect for you. 
This is how we got in trouble and in the situation that we're in in the first place. Let me show you what happened as a result of us having no respect for the Lord. Deuteronomy 28 verses 47 through 48. Deuteronomy 28, verses 47 and 48. We're going to show you this real quick and jump back on Pentecost. Deuteronomy 28, verses 47 through 48. This is how we got the curse, brothers and sisters. It says, Because thou serveth not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things, I blessed you with all these things. You've been abundant, but you ain't, but you ain't serving me with gladness and in joyfulness. You always complaining. You always murmuring like our fathers did in the wilderness. Verse 48 said, therefore shall you serve your enemies. What are we doing today? What have we been doing since we landed over here on the uh, shores of America in 1619 in Virginia? Our captives that came and got us. It says, therefore, you shall serve your enemies, which the Lord shall send against you. <clears throat> we don't want to look at that. We want to say the white man, the white man. Who sent the white man, brothers and sisters? You ain't got to think about it. Just read it. It says, therefore, you shall serve your enemies, which the Lord shall send against you in hunger and thirst in nakedness and in all want and in, in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed you. So today you don't even know the name Israel anymore. You don't even identify with being an Israelite. You're an African-American. You have been totally destroyed. And another people are assuming our identity, living in our land, warring and fighting over our land. They just don't know that the so-called Jews, which are Edomites that are over there fighting and Gentiles because Gentiles came in in 1948 after the persecution of Hitler and Germany, those Germans which adopted the religion of the Israelites and changed their names to Jews. In 1948, they were taken, these Gentiles were taken from Germany and placed over there with the Edomites in Israel today. So you got Gentiles and Edomites living amongst each other, blending in amongst each other, calling themselves Jews. And we don't even call ourselves Jews because how do you know that you come from the tribe of Judah, which is where the term Jew come from, Judah? We know that we are Israelites, but we just don't know which tribe. So we don't use the term Jew. We use the term Israel, brothers and sisters, or Israelite. So they're fighting. Our twin brother uh, um, Esau is fighting with our other brother or cousin, which is Ishmael. Remember, Abraham had two sons, Ishmael, and then he had Isaac. So Ishmael, that's the Arab over there. And Esau, that's the Edomite that's over there. They're both warring right now, fighting over our land. Just don't know that when Jesus comes back, they're not going to be over there anyway because he's going to gather us and bring us back into the land. That's what Pentecost is all about. Restoring us, brothers and sisters. So let's go ahead and keep reading, man. I'm getting excited a little bit right now. Let's go to the book of Exodus, the 34th chapter. Pentecost, again, was called by several names in the Bible. The Feast of Harvest, the Feast of Weeks, and of course, Pentecost. So when you see the Feast of Weeks, uh, you know what? When I first started hearing that, I didn't know what the hell they was talking about, the Feast of Weeks. I thought they were saying wheat, as in wheat grass, the Feast of Weeks, when I first heard it, until I began to study it and learn it a little bit more. Now I know that weeks consist of several weeks in the year. 
seven weeks, seven Sabbaths. So that's how you got the term Feast of Weeks, okay? But another term you have is the Feast of Harvest, because this is a harvest feast, brothers and sisters. So let's go to Exodus 34 and 22. Exodus 34 and 22. We're dealing with the day of Pentecost, brothers and sisters, which happens this Sunday or Saturday at sundown. Exodus 34, 22, and it reads, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Uh-oh, you got the term ingathering, brothers and sisters. I want you to remember that term in gathering because that's another event that happens, brothers and sisters. OK, the gathering, all of that coincides and correlates together. All right. So let's go to the book of Numbers, the 28th chapter. Numbers, the 28th chapter, verse 26. Numbers 28 and verse 26, and it reads, Also, in the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering unto the Lord, after your weeks be out, after your weeks be out, you shall have a holy convocation, a gathering. You shall do no servile work. So again, brothers and sisters, a gathering, a feast, an offering, and no work. A gathering, a feast, an offering, and no work. Four components, brothers and sisters. Right? So now, let's go ahead and continue going. I know Sister Key Israel like these places when I go, when I just read one verse out of those places. Okay, cool. Now, why keep the Feast of Pentecost? Do we have to keep Pen um, Pentecost? Yes, brothers and sisters, it is a law. It is a law to keep Pentecost. Now, some would say, again, this is the Old Testament, Brother Black Ice. Um, we don't have to do those things anymore. The Bible begs to differ, brothers and sisters. Even after the death of Jesus, they kept the day of Pentecost, right? The followers of Jesus kept the day of Pentecost. Let's go to the book of Colossians. Colossians 2 and 14. Now we're going to deal with some New Testament. Colossians 2 and 14. And it reads, Colossians 2 and 14. Check this out. I'm going to start at 13, Sister Key. I'm sorry, I'm going to do 13 and 14. It says, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. What did the Lord take out of the way? The law of animal sacrifice. He took it out of the way and replaced it. So now we don't have to kill animals and make offerings anymore because he replaced that with the offering of his own body and the shedding of his own blood. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. What did he nail to the cross again? The law of animal sacrifice. We don't have to do that anymore. He replaced it, brothers and sisters. Let's continue reading. Let's go to the book of Acts, the first chapter. The book of Acts, the first chapter. We're going to start that at verse 1 through 9. Acts, the first chapter, verses 1 through 9. And it reads, it says, 
The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power. And after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Sumeria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, even over here in America, brothers and sisters. Uttermost parts of the earth, right? We're going to be witnesses. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And so now as he left, he left us another comforter, even the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, which is the word of God, which gives us power which gives us power. I'm going somewhere here, brothers and sisters, so hold on to your thinking caps and your seats because I want to show you how the anointing came unto them on the day of Pentecost, right? Now, we ain't read nothing about speaking in tongues so far because the day of Pentecost is not about speaking in tongues, although the whole Christian world have made it about speaking in tongues. Again, the day of Pentecost is not about speaking in tongues. Although, whenever you hear the teachings of the words of Pentecost, they say, yeah, they gave them the ability to speak in tongues. Let's go ahead and read this. Acts the second chapter. Acts the second chapter. Let's read a little bit. Let's read a little bit. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Here it is now. The angels. Now, Sister Key, Israel, let's see what, how far we're going to go down in this. Because I know I didn't give you all of it, right? Um, man, this is a lot of stuff. Mm, mm, mm. So, Sister Key, let's go to... Um, we can go to verse, verse seven. All right. One through seven. Let's go to one through seven. Right. So I got to go back, man, because, um, I'm loving this right now and I got to, um, put some sound effects to this to, to, to really get y'all in the spirit of what we are talking about. <laughs> all right. Let me see. So let's go back uh, and read this and let's get some, there we go. So let's start back at the top, Sister Key. Let's start at verse one. Let's, let's start at verse one. Let's do this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and as it sat upon each of them. Now, let's stop right there, brothers and sisters. Remember the hand that they saw that was just writing on the wall? One of the angels appeared in the form of a hand. Okay, that's all. Angels can appear in different forms. Here, these angels appeared in cloven tongues. That's all. But 
the cloven tongues were a symbol of interpretation. So the best example that we have today of what these cloven tongues represented is when your president goes to the United Nations and everybody in the United Nations have an earpiece hanging out of their ear. And in the earpiece, there's someone speaking in their language, although the speaker is speaking in his own language, right? So speaking in tongues was not some uninterpretable thing that didn't nobody know what the person was talking about. It was just another language. That's all. But because of spiritual ignorance, we have a whole different meaning and a whole different doctrine that came out of that, brothers and sisters. Whole different meaning and a whole different doctrine that came out of that. I want to show you something. This is what came out of that, brothers and sisters. And then I'll explain to you the Bible's definition of speaking in tongues. A pastor here from Mississippi. His name is John Kilpatrick. And he's going to do some speaking in tongues for us. I've got a question for you. If somebody has problems with demon possession, where are they going to get help? At CNN? Where are they going to get help? In the mental institution? It ought to be in the house of God. It ought to be in the house of God. If somebody's got demons, if somebody's bound by demons, they don't need the men in the white coats. They don't necessarily need medication. They need somebody with authority and power and anointing that says, be gone in the name of Jesus and be set free. I've seen it. I know what I'm talking about. Oh, come on, give God praise. Politically correct mindset would say, I'm a crazy man. Let me fast forward it. The equivalent of doing. Let me, let me fast forward. Let me fast forward it. Let me see if I can get another example. So, the question is, what in the hell, or in this hell, is that, or what is she saying? Now, the reason why we go there, brothers and sisters, is because if you speak in another language, you must have an interpreter according to the Bible, right? But now let's look at what happened on the day of Pentecost. Verse 3, Acts 2 and 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devouted men, out of every nation under the sun. So these were only Jews, but it came from every nation. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So these were Galileans that were speaking, and at verse 8 and said, How and how hear we every man in our own tongue, our own language, wherein we were born? 
So they were able to hear what these Galileans were saying in their own language. These cloven tongues provided them with the interpretation of what they were saying. There was an interpreter there, brothers and sisters. It wasn't what you just heard that woman speaking on YouTube, which no man could interpret. It was just another language that they were speaking that was outside of the language of the Galileans and they had an interpreter. And then at verse um, 12 through 15, it says, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what mean of this? Others marking saying, these men are full of new wine. But Peter standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass, verse 17, In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, not speak in tongues. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So brothers and sisters, it's about prophesying. It's not about speaking in an uninterpretable tongue. It's about prophesying. So when you talk about Pentecost and people start saying, yeah, that was when they gave them the ability to speak in tongues. Yeah. To speak in the languages of the other Jews that came from around the world to come before the day of Pentecost. That's all it was. That would be equivalent to me speaking to you in Spanish. And then having someone translate what I said to you in Spanish. So if I said, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. That would be an interpreter say, oh, he just said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I just spoke to you in tongues in another language. So don't get confused with all of that. So let's go back to Pentecost, brothers and sisters. Um, man, so let's go to Acts 20 and 16. Acts 20 and 16. Acts 20 and 16. And it reads. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted. He hurried up. If it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So Pentecost was so important. And it was a commandment of the Lord to keep. That every male. Was commanded to come to Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost, right? And there were actually three days, unleavened bread, Pentecost, and um, the Feast of Tabernacles. So Paul was trying to hurry up and get to Jerusalem so that he could keep the day of Pentecost, right? So I'm going to skip this um, section right here because of the, um, the time, Sister Key Israel, um, that a gathering is required because we spoke on that um, already, Sister Key. Um, but let me just show you real quick how the world piggybacked off God or, or copycatted off God. Because again, this was part of God's social program, right? When you gave your first and when you give, gave your best, in return, the Levite, whom you would give it to, would turn it around, would turn around and give it to the widows, to the fatherless, to the homeless. So this was part of God's, what do you call it? Um, um, what the government called a program, um, public aid, 
This was part of God's public aid program, right? So let's go to Deuteronomy 14 and 12, um, 22. Deuteronomy 14 and 22. And it says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field brings forth year by year. So the Lord wanted you to tithe, brothers and sisters. And let's continue to, to, to show you what the Lord said. Because see, if you were going somewhere and, and it was too far for you to carry all these things to the Levites in the land where he chose to place his name, which was Jerusalem. Look at what he wants you, wanted you to do at verse 24. Deuteronomy 14 and 24. Let's do 24 uh, through 27, Sister Key. 24 through 27, Deuteronomy 14, 24 through 27. It says, and if the way be too long for thee, so that you are not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God has blessed you, then shall you turn it into money and bind it, bind up the money in your hand and shall go unto the place which the Lord God shall choose. And you shall bestow that money for whatsoever your soul lusteth after, for oxen or sheep or wine or for strong drink or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shall eat there before the Lord thy God and shall rejoice you and your household. And the Levite that is within thy gates shall not forsake him, for he has no part nor inheritance with thee. Right? So you got to give this, you know, you got to give the Levite his portion because he had no inheritance, right? Now, verse 29 is the key because this is part of God's public aid program. It says, and the Levite, because he has no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which is within thy gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, and the Lord thy God may bless thee and all the work of thine hand which thou do. Right? Now, we're going to take that which was just read, and I want to show you the United States government program that is modeled after the Lord's program. This is called the social safety net of the United States. The social safety net of the United States is made up of various welfare programs to protect low-income Americans from poverty and hardship. The programs are meant to be a safety net to catch Americans if they fall on hard times. The goal is to get Americans of sound body and mind back on their feet. For those individuals without sound body and mind, the goal is to protect them with the minimum standard of living. These social safety net programs are non-contributing um, transfer payment programs. In other words, low-income Americans get the benefits for free. They don't have to contribute into the programs to receive the benefits. And just like the Lord did in Deuteronomy 14, 29, the widows... The fatherless, the homeless, the Levites, they all got the benefits of these blessings for free. All right? So we're talking about Pentecost. We're talking about the meaning. We're talking about the purpose. We're talking about how to do these things in the way the Lord required it. A gathering, an offering, right? Right? Um, and, and y'all, Sister Key, remind me of the other two, you know, it's there in my mind, but I got all these things here that I want to cover. Um, uh, but these are things that the Lord requires, brothers and sisters. He wants us to keep this feast day. You got to have a, a, a dinner or a feast. That was one of the other ones, right? Got to have a feast, got to have a gathering, got to have an offering. And y'all let me know the fourth one because it's slipping my mind right now. So now, let's go, Sister Key Israel, and close this thing out because we went way over time. 
And this is our first Pentecost lesson, brothers and sisters. We haven't done a Pentecost lesson before. So y'all know how I am on the research, man. I want to get information from everywhere in order for you to be able to get it. But let's close this thing out. What does the day of Pentecost represent, brothers and sisters? The first fruits, right? Who is the first fruit of them that slept? It is none other than Jesus, the Christ. He is the first fruits. He is the best of our offering that we could give. And so, brothers and sisters, this whole thing is about Jesus, is about the year of the Lord in which he comes back, the day of the Lord in which he comes back, and the gathering of Israel and the first resurrection. Because the first resurrection, brothers and sisters, contains the first fruits. Again, the first resurrection contains the first fruits and the best fruits. Now, let's go to Revelations 1 and 7. Revelations 1 and 7. And we're getting ready to close this thing out. We just got three more place, places. Revelations 1 and 7. And it reads. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so. Amen. So now the Lord is coming, right? Now, let's go to. The book of Leviticus, the 25th chapter. Leviticus, the 25th chapter. So we know that the Lord is coming. He is the first fruits of us that slept. Okay? The first fruits. Leviticus, the 25th chapter. And we're going to start at verse 1. Leviticus 25. And we're going to start at verse 1. And it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, verses 1 through 4, and the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I give you, then shall you keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field. Six thousand years we are in this flesh and blood body. 6,000 years, brothers. I'm sorry, 7,000 years we have the flesh and blood body, but 6,000 years of those 7,000 years we labor. Okay? Let me correct myself and say it right. 7,000 years we are in this flesh and blood body, but 6,000 years out of the seven we labor, brothers and sisters. So I want you to relate that to what's being told to Moses. Six years thou shalt sow the field, you labor. And six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath. What's the seventh year? A Sabbath. The day of rest. The thousand year reign of Christ, brothers and sisters. It's a rest for us. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the Lord. A Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. So there you have it, brothers and sisters. 6,000 years. Man got to do this thing on his own because we messed up. We disconnected ourselves from our Lord, so the Lord disconnected himself from us. He said, okay, you figure this thing out. You think you know the best way of doing this thing 6,000 years, we're going to put it in your hand to do it. But after the 6,000 years is up, after the six days are up, is the Sabbath, brothers and sisters. And that's what the Sabbath represents. That's what the Pentecost represents, brothers and sisters. The coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the thousand years of peace. The thousand years of peace. Let's go down to the eighth verse. And let's do 8 through 14. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years. Seven Sabbaths of years unto thee. Seven times seven years. 
and the space of seven Sabbaths of seven shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shall you cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound. What does the trumpet represent? The trumpet represents the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus. The memorial of the blowing of trumpets. Then shall you cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month and the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall hollow the fiftieth year. Seven Sabbaths, 49 years, seven years times seven, 49 years. You see how all of this is coming together. And you shall hollow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man unto his possession. That's why the Lord, when he comes, he gathers us from the four corners of the earth and brings us back into the land. And that's why earlier in this lesson, I spoke about the conflict and the war that they got going over there now. It's our land. They got to be removed or come out when the Lord comes back. And you shall return every man unto his possession. And you shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall, shall that 50th year be unto you. You shall not sow neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the land. In the year of the Jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. So ain't going to be no oppressors. Ain't going to be no more governments of leaders. There's going to be one government, one leader, one king of kings and one Lord of lords, brothers and sisters, on that 50th year, that jubilee, that, that, that Pentecost. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let's close out with Revelations, the 20th chapter, verses 4 and 5. Revelations, the 20th chapter, verses 4 and 5. And it reads, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them which were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection, the first fruits, Pentecost, the offering, brothers and sisters, that's the blessing. So when we bless the Lord, the Lord will turn around and bless us. And I'll close out with Revelation 20 and 6. Blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Brothers and sisters, the Pentecost, the 50th day, the 50th year, the year that the Lord returned, the day that the Lord returns, brothers and sisters. The thousand years of peace after the 6,000 years that man have worked himself, have sweated, have labored. Now is the time of peace. Now is the time of rest. The day of Pentecost, the meaning and the purpose. I thank you so much for your time. Woo, brothers and sisters, that was a. A little bit of a lengthy lesson with a lot of information, but you can always go back and watch it. We want to thank our YouTube listeners. If you are watching via YouTube, then go on our Facebook page and like our Facebook page, which is The Truth Hour. 
Bible show, the Truth Hour Bible show. Now, those who are watching the uh, Facebook, we want you to go and like our YouTube channel, which is Truth Hour TV. Again, like our YouTube channel, which is Truth Hour TV. Okay, I'm putting that in the comment section. And if you would like to be added to our text message invite reminder list, then text your name and the keywords Truth Hour to that number that I just posted. 312-719-7310. 312-719-7310. And we will send you a text message right before we go live to let you know what the lesson is going to be for that particular Tuesday. Be ready and be prepared for the Feast of Pentecost coming up this Sunday, Saturday at sundown to Sunday at sundown, brothers and sisters. OK, please be prepared for it and try to keep it. And if you have questions in regards to how to keep it, then reach out to your brothers and your sisters. Um, again, we have mm, let me see if I can find it. I don't know where it is. We have the maps, brothers and sisters. We have the maps, <clears throat> and uh, we thank our brothers and our sisters who just ordered the maps, but the maps is of our family tree. If you want to know before slavery, what your history was before slavery, then get the map, brothers and sisters. Then get the map, okay? The map is $35 that includes shipping. Again, it's $35 and it includes shipping. And there's a map of our history. And it starts from Adam all the way to the transatlantic slave trade. And it has supporting scriptures to back up everything that's mentioned in the map, okay? It has supporting scriptures. All of that is little writing there. Okay. Also, um, we spoke about um, the new album that I have out. I have a double album that I just released. That album is $20. And if you would like to support, then um, I'm going to put the Cash App and the Zelle in the comment section. And um, if you would like to make a donation to the Bible Class Truth Hour, then that is available for you to do too. I would love to get some of the technology that our brother Aza has where I won't have to be holding up my phone <laughs> to the other phone in order for you to see some of the graphics and some of the things that are in there. So, you know, as we get donations, our technology gets better and our experience gets better as well, all right? So these are um, the shirts right here. And again, um, it's going to show backwards to you because for some reason, Facebook shows the things backwards. But this is the shirt right here. Biblical Christianity is unpopular. Popular Christianity is unbiblical. Truth Hour, the shirts are $30. And uh, shipping is 5 so it's 35 for the shirts too. And um, that includes shipping. And uh, let me see. Uh, I think I showed you guys the female shirt earlier. Yeah, I think I showed you the female shirt earlier. So we have female shirts and we have the regular shirts. Okay, so we got the maps. We got the shirts. We got the new album. Um, the Cash App and the Zelle is in the comment section. Um, my phone number is in the comment section. So all I would need is your address. And then I would begin the process of shipping these things to you. I will be shipping um, out tomorrow to Sister Yvette, to Sister Key Israel. And uh, I think it was a couple of other people. I think Sister Key Israel is also getting her album um, as well. So again, brothers and sisters, you have everything. Those are the announcements that we have. Again, we want to continue to pray for our Sister Margaret Cobb and all those who may be suffering from illness at this time. We want to let you know that we are thinking about you and you are also in our prayers. 
Sister Key, did I forget anything? Did I forget any announcements that I needed to make before we get into our prayer? Or anyone from Team Truth Hour? Matter of fact, Team Truth Hour, put your uh, put Team Truth Hour in the comment section. Um, if you would like to be a member of our online ministry, uh, we're looking for more members of our online Bible-based ministry to help spread this word, get this word out, to share these lessons, to invite people to the lessons. When we come on, we can never have enough help uh, with this ministry. Then we would love for you to become a part of Team Truth Hour. Okay? We would love for you to become a part of Team Truth Hour. So they are putting t um, Truth Hour in the comment section. And you can reach out with anyone that is from Team Truth Hour, okay? So with that being said, brothers and sisters, let's stand up, face Jerusalem, and pray out. And let's, um, let's encourage one another and strengthen one another. And um, let people know how you are celebrating your Pentecost, okay? Uh, also, um, the aunt of Sister Key Israel, Dolores Wells, we're going to continue to pray uh, for her. We're going to pray for her. And continue to pray for Sister Margaret Cobb and others as well, okay? All right, so let's um, face Jerusalem. If you guys can hang in there about um, 30 more seconds, let's go ahead and close out. Father God, we come before you today, Father God, and we say thank you for another powerful lesson, Father God. I pray, Father God, that what you allow me to deliver in your name and in your word will suffice, Father God. Father God, we ask that you... Cover, Father God, all those that are dealing with sicknesses and illness, Sister Dolores Wells, Sister Margaret Cobb, and many others, Father God, who are dealing with illness, ailments and illnesses and sicknesses and issues in their marriages or, or on their job or in their finances, Father God. We ask that you come, Father God, and give them, give them strength, Father God, and give them peace, peace, Father God, and let them know that all they need is just a little bit of faith. As your word required, just the faith the size of a mustard seed, Father God, they can begin to move the mountains and the obstacles in their life, Father God. We pray again that that this lesson, um, those who are watching and listening were edified and that you were glorified, Father God. We ask that you bless us as we attempt to celebrate your feast of Pentecost, Father God. Show us how to do it, Father God, and how you want it done. We ask this prayer in your son Jesus Yeshua name. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, that will conclude our lesson for today, the Feast of Pentecost. And um, man, share this lesson, share this lesson, and we'll be putting it on YouTube shortly. Uh, I feel like I've been in the gym working out. <laughs> I, feel, I feel maybe that energy is coming down a little bit, but um, I love this word, brothers and sisters. Um, as just like you, I am attempting to get this thing as right as possible, you know, and um, I have the same challenges you have um, and the same temptations that you have. And so as I ward these things off and fight these things that tried to come and bombard me um, against teaching the word of God and against live and, and against living the way that God wants me to live, y'all continue to pray for your brother as well. Um, because again, you know, that Satan does not want me to do what I'm doing. And he's going to try everything within his power to throw me off the path as he's going to try to do you the same way. So continue to pray for your brother as I will continue to pray for you. Thank you so much for tuning in until next Tuesday. Peace in Jesus name.